On this edition of the Garnet Research Roundup, I'm delighted to be joined by a member of the Garnet Advisory Committee, Dr. Daniel Gibbs from the University of Birmingham. And we're going to be talking about a paper just published in Nature Communications, the title of which is Oxygen-Dependent Proteolysis Regulates the Stability of Angiosperm Polychrome Repressive Complex 2 Subunit Vernalization 2. Thanks, Dan, for joining us today, and it would be great if you could give us an, an overview of, of this paper, please. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Geraint. Um, so, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank you for choosing the paper. You know, we're, we're really excited to finally have this work published. It's been going on for a few years now. Um, and before I start, I just wanted to, you know, point out that this is a collaboration between uh, myself and my lab at the University of Birmingham. Um, and Mike Holdsworth at the University of Nottingham, um, alongside colleagues uh, in chemistry, um, in the chemistry department in Oxford and the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. So there's been quite a few people involved. Um, so as you said in the title, this uh, work is about the polycomb repressive complex 2, um, which is a, a key complex in plants. Um, it regulates the epigenetic gene repression through histone methylation. Um, and while several developmental functions and gene targets of this complex are known, um, mechanisms connecting the accumulation and activity of the complex to the environment are relatively poorly understood. And so what we've done with this work is we've identified a, a post-translational mechanism that's controlling the stability of a component of this complex called vernalization 2. And we've shown that this is important for regulating its abundance in response to different environmental signals. Actually, this work um, stems from previous work that was done with Mike when I was in Nottingham as a postdoc, uh, where we identified a group of transcription factors that are targets of a degradation pathway called the NN rule pathway. Mm -hmm. And we showed that these transcription factors um, are regulated in an oxygen-dependent manner. And this occurs via a specific motif that is found at their end terminus, which begins with a methionine and a cysteine. And so around the time we were doing that work, we thought that perhaps other proteins with one of these similar motifs at the beginning, so with a methionine, cysteine, and terminus, um, we thought maybe they are also targeted by the pathway. Um, and so we, we, we started searching for potential candidates, and this is where Vern2 Vernalization 2 was pulled out because it has a very highly conserved methionine, cysteine, dipeptide at the beginning that's conserved throughout the flowering plant. So essentially, um, what we've done with this paper is we've investigated whether or not Vern2 is a target of this pathway, and we found that it is. We've shown that its stability is regulated in an oxygen and nitric oxide dependent manner through the pathway, and which means that essentially when these gases are present, the protein's being degraded, and when you have a depletion of these gases, it's stabilized. And so why we think this is important is that it means that under you know normal growth conditions, Vern2 levels are being restricted by the end rule pathway and that this regulation allows the protein to then accumulate when environmental conditions changed. Um, so we've shown, for example, during flooding, when you inhibit um, oxidation of this protein at its end terminus, you get accumulation of the protein. Um, and we've also shown that um, as a result of that, this protein Vern2 has an, has an important role in regulating flooding tolerance, which is a new function to Vern2. Okay. Okay. So that's cool. So you mentioned uh, a lot about the hypoxia response there and some of the previous work you, you did. But obviously, Vern2, we know a lot about it is, is involved in vernalization and therefore the cold response. So, um, what data have you got which links kind of the hypoxia response and the cold response? So, intuitively, they don't seem incredibly well uh, linked initially, but obviously, you've got some data that do link, link it together. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, we, it seems that the enandrol pathway is important for restricting Vern2. Um, in the absence of appropriate environmental signals. So one of these signals is hypoxia, so reduced oxygen, and that causes accumulation. But we've also shown that um, cold also um, induces accumulation of Vern2 and that this is dependent on the NN rule also. So essentially, in response to either hypoxia or cold, we have um, accumulation of the protein. So as you say, you wouldn't necessarily consider these two environmental situations to be similar. Um, we tried to look at this a bit further to see how and why both of these conditions cause accumulation of Vern2. And what we found was actually when we did a transcriptome analysis, we found that there's quite a strong overlap between the genes that are induced by either long-term cold exposure or low oxygen stress. This includes lots of genes associated with anaerobic responses. So that does suggest that there are similarities going on in the cells of these plants in response to these different conditions. Mm -hmm. um, 
So one we haven't um, we haven't fully um, validated this yet, but one idea we have is perhaps um, cold temperatures are interfering with mitochondrial function, okay. um, and this means that the plants might be experiencing um, some sort of energy crisis, which might be perceived as similar to what happens when you have oxygen stress, um, and together somehow these this is also feeding into regulation of them too. Hmm. Um, we've also shown that cold temperature um, affects the activity of certain enzymes involved in the anandrol pathway and that it also causes depletions of nitric oxide and both of these conditions um, would also cause stabilization of them too. Yeah, um, and so essentially we think that um, although it seems perhaps counterintuitive, there, there are similarities in the cellular response to either hypoxia or cold temperature. Um, yeah. So we think accumulation of energy during the cold might be related to biochemical changes that either induce or mimic oxygen limitation. Okay, cool. So you in, in the title, the title mentions angiosperms. So yes. can you say something about um, what you found about the, the differences um, in Vern 2 across different lineages, plant lineages? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, so Vern 2 is part of this polyclone repressive complex 2 or the PRC2. And so this is made of um, four core proteins and um, is conserved in plants and in animals. But in, in plants, and particularly in flowering plants, um, that there are multiple copies of each of these subunits. So, for example, um, Vern 2 is one of three homologs in Arabidopsis, the others being FIS2 and EMF2. And so something we were interested in was understanding how and why Vern2 became co-opted to the enendral pathway during evolution. Now, the reason for that is that if you look in animals, the equivalent of Vern2 in animals is a protein called SUZ12, and this is not regulated by the enendral pathway. And so somehow during the evolution of plants, it was co-opted. So what we did was we, we had a look at all the Vern2 homologs in, in sequence flowering plants and in um, earlier um, evolving plant species, and we found that, um, or confirming previous studies, we found that Vern2 and Vern2-like proteins seem to be exclusive to the flowering plant lineage. Okay. Um, and it had previously been speculated that Vern2 evolved as a result of a duplication of an ancient homologue of a protein called EMF2. So when we did a series of alignments of these proteins from different species, we, what we found was that Vern2 is N-terminus, which begins methionine cysteine, and perfectly aligned with an internal methionine cysteine that is found in the EMF2 homologue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we know that EMF2 evolved earlier than Vern2, and if we look back at these earlier evolved variants, which are in gymnosperms, um, they also have this MC, internal MC. And so what we were able to first of all speculate and then confirm using biochemical and phylogenetic analyses was that, you know, when Vern2 was duplicated, we believe there may also have been an N-terminal truncation that exposed this methionine cysteine, which was already present in the protein, and that's what allowed it to then be co-opted to the n pathway. So, I mean, that uh, gives a bit of a philosophical question, what came first, the flowering or the, or the Vern2, but I, I don't think we can answer yeah, that I mean, right away. It's, it's interesting, and you know, I think it's particularly interesting that you know this complex PRC2 is widely conserved throughout the eukaryotes, mm -hmm. and the n rule pathway is also widely conserved throughout the eukaryotes, so they've, they've both evolved, and then it seems specifically in the angiosperms, these two separate um, things, the PRC2 and the n rule pathway, have, have, have converged, and it's led to a beneficial output for the plant. So, as a final question, is the work in this paper leading on to any other additional studies in your, your lab? Uh, yes, so we're, we're, we're very interested in Vern2 and, and particularly interested now in connecting how this control of its stability directly relates to its functions. So, um, we spoke earlier that Vern2 um, has this role in flowering, in the vernalization flowering response, and so now we're trying to... Um, connect um, regulation of Vern2 stability to its activity at the um, flora repressive gene FLC, which is known to be the crucial regulator of vernalization. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also interested in widening um, our understanding of Vern2 functions. So in this paper, we've connected it to the regulation of hypoxia stress, which is something that occurs frequently during flooding. Mm -hmm. And we want to try and identify what gene targets Vern2 has um, which are controlling this response. So in my lab at the moment, um, this is work funded by an ERC startup grant that I've got to look at Vern2 
Um, we're doing some genome-wide RNA-seq and chip-seq analyses in a variety of different genetic backgrounds to try and identify global gene targets of this complex that may be responsive to the regulation of vern stability when either flooding or cold um, uh, leads to its accumulation. Cool. All right, that sounds great. Oh, well, well, we'll certainly look forward to... Uh... To, to reading about those outputs over the over the coming year or so. All right, so yeah. so thanks very much, Daniel, for uh, for uh, joining us today. It was very interesting. Okay, thank you very much.